I've been running my super simple Hackintosh build for almost two months, and it's time for the first two big tests. First, can I apply a macOS system update? And second, can I get continuity and handoff to work? Stay tuned to find out. Installing macOS High Sierra on my Hackintosh was almost trivial as I detailed in my super simple Hackintosh video, link in the doobly-doo. But the true bugaboo for Hackintoshes isn't the installation, but rather the system updates. I remember them being extremely problematic back in 2011 when I was last in this community, so I was extremely interested to see if things had gotten better. I do hedge my bets a little by downloading the update manually rather than getting it from the App Store. You can do it either way, but bypassing the App Store does make it mildly easier to just have the DMG without having to abort the install process and find out where the DMG is. Either way is fine in the end. Before I do the update though, I want to make sure that my backups are solid. And yes, I do mean backups, plural. I start with Time Machine, which is roughly hourly, and make sure that I'm fully up to date. This is what I would use to revert any failed update, if necessary. But I'm paranoid enough that one backup is simply not enough. I also have a full clone of my main drive using Carbon Copy Cloner, which runs every night. This is bootable, so I'd use that to boot back into my Hackintosh to aid while debugging any failed updates, if that should happen. Time Machine, then, is for restoration, while the clone is for debugging and exploration. Better safe than sorry. The update starts just like any other software installation or update. Open the DMG, click, 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 here's my password, click, click, blah, 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 standard stuff. And like normal, it goes into the black screen with the Installing Software Update progress bar. And then it reboots. Here's where we might run into trouble if the right boot target isn't selected. We see that there is a new boot target called Boot Mac OS Install for Macintosh HD. This is different from the normal default boot option which is Boot Mac OS for Macintosh HD. It's important that the install image is the chosen one which isn't a problem normally, since that will be the default in Clover. I stop the automatic boot only to demonstrate the difference. It does do the right thing on its own. When it starts up, it gives the traditional incredibly wrong time estimate. I don't even know why Apple shows that number, since it's not ever going to be even a little bit close. Anyway, this is all standard and isn't Hackintosh specific. We then reboot a second time. This time, note that the default boot option is back to the regular boot macOS for Macintosh HD. There's no install option anymore. Oh, and here is the bootable clone that I was talking about. Just cause. This would also do the right thing automatically if I hadn't interrupted the boot. So carry on. In fact, if you take away anything from all this so far, is that there's been nothing at all special about this update. I could have just used the app store to do the update and then ignored it until it's done. Every automatic choice was the correct one, and I didn't have to do any preparation at all. Very, very nice. When I log in for the first time after the update, I see a pop-up saying that the default graphics are in use because I don't have a compatible NVIDIA driver. Also, LastPass started up for some reason, so excuse the blurred background app. NVIDIA now has a preference plane for taking care of these updates. I click on the Check Now button, and it downloads and installs the update without any fuss. As easy as this is, it is Hackintosh specific. You wouldn't have to update the graphic drivers separately with a hardware Mac. You also wouldn't have to if you were just using the built-in Intel graphics. Also, this is not a good NVIDIA update. There is notable lag at times, and it just seems like the performance dropped a bit. It does work though, and if I care enough, there is a way to fool the system to keep the older and more stable driver version. Uh, this, this all feels very Windows-like. I will stress that to date though, I haven't had to edit any config or plist files or manually patch anything or really do anything but point and click. So my goal of a super simple Hackintosh is still fully on track. Okay, one final verification after the final reboot. Yep, there's my 13.3.3 and my NVIDIA drivers. Simple indeed. Sweet. I mentioned in my original installation video that I didn't care if continuity and handoff worked but I sort of lied. In particular, I do like AirDrop quite a bit, and I found myself missing the ability to answer my phone on my Mac. I also really like having my messages in total sync and have the ability to send SMS messages from my Mac. 
None of that worked with my original build because they all require Wi-Fi and will not work over wired Ethernet. Now there are recommendations for compatible Wi-Fi cards on sites like Tony Mac and those would potentially get me airdrop, but they wouldn't get me the rest of the continuity features. I don't actually care about being on Wi-Fi itself, so that limitation was fatal for me. What I need for continuity to work is a Wi-Fi card that uses the same Broadcom chip that Apple uses, so that it's completely fooled into thinking everything is 100% native. And well, it needs to be available. The canonical source for these cards is osxwifi.com. And yeah, I'm pronouncing the X in that name because, well, it's a proper name, and pronouncing it OS X could potentially infringe on copyright. So they must pronounce it OS X. Anyway, I don't care about Bluetooth 4.1, so let's go for the cheaper option. Indeed, it does have the required Broadcom BCM94360CD chip. They guarantee Hackintosh compatibility and even directly talk about working airdrop and continuing handoff. Sweet. But $135? Yikes. That's just way too much. Since I know the Broadcom chip number, I could just get a card directly from China via AliExpress. This one does have the right chip and it mentions Apple in English. But, you know, I hate to be one of those typical Americans that only understands English, but well, I am one of those Americans that only understands English. And since this is a JPEG image, even Google Translate can't help me. So I hurried over to eBay with my tail between my legs, and I found this listing. It explicitly mentions the BCM 94360CD chip and Hackintosh support. And at less than $60, it's more than half the cost of the OSXWiFi.com models. Plus, this one does go on in English about its support for native airdrop continuity and handoff. It's a bit of a risk, but I see that the seller is very active and has 99.2% positivity. The month-long shipping is hard to swallow now that I'm used to next day and even same day shipping from Amazon. But whatever, it's worth the wait if it works. I finally got the Wi-Fi card after about a month, and yep, it came directly from Shenzhen, China. The user manual is entirely in Chinese too. Opening the box, I see four antennas and a cable to hook up the Bluetooth module to the motherboard. And then the card itself, and hey, that's precisely the same card as the one I saw on AliExpress, at about 40 bucks less. Curious. The card uses a 1x PCIe slot, and handily, I still have a free slot on my motherboard. I've heard stories that it doesn't work quite as well if you use a different PCIe slot. I'll admit that the cable threw me for a loop for a tiny bit, since I wasn't 100% certain what I should plug it into in the motherboard. I couldn't find any docs that said if it was USB or not. But boy did it look like a USB 2.0 header, all the way down to the blocked off pin slot next to the grounds that corresponds to the missing pin on the USB 2.0 motherboard header. So I plugged one side of the cable into the card, and the other into the motherboard, and since they each would only fit one precise way, I assumed it was correct. And spoiler, it was. The final step was just to screw in the four antennas. And I was done. So does it work? Well, as promised, there was absolutely no software setup required at all. When I booted up my Hackintosh, I saw a Wi-Fi icon in the menu bar, and it already connected to my network with settings imported from my old Mac Mini. Oh, and notice the KG6S Plus personal hotspot? That's my iPhone, and that strongly suggests that continuity is working, since personal hotspots are one of the continuity features. Going over to the system profiler, I see that handoff supported is listed as yes. Moving on to the network and Wi-Fi, I see that my hardware is listed as an airport. Both very promising signs. My first test is to open up Notes app on my iPhone. And there it is in the dock. I also verified that I could hand off the notes off screen, but I don't show it here because, well, there was far too much personal info being shown. Moving on, I try the same with Safari on my iPhone and voila, there it is in the dock as well. The final test for now is AirDrop, since that's what I want to use the most. Ta-da! There's my iPhone. Very, very sweet. Off camera, I verified that messages are now synced rock solid between my Hackintosh and my iPhone, and I can even send SMS messages from the Mac Messages app. I also did some phone calling and FaceTime flawlessly. Having a card like this then appears to be worth every penny, since I didn't need to jump through any hoops at all, and literally everything worked without a hitch. Highly, highly recommended. I wanted to do one final upgrade while I'm at it. 
I've used an LG USB 3.0 Blu-ray drive to rip my movies from my home theater for a couple of years now. But it feels notably slow, and it's getting more and more flaky. So I bought an internal LG Blu-ray drive. Installation was trivial. Now that my internal Blu-ray drive is installed, I might as well do a direct test to see if it is indeed faster than the external drive. I used the exact same Blu-ray of Star Wars The Force Awakens and ripped the same title to my SSD drive using the same copy of Make MKV. The only difference then is in the drive itself. What I see is that both take about 20 seconds to recognize the disc and find the titles. During the ripping process though, I see that the internal drive is sustaining between 5x and 7x rip speeds throughout the entire process, whereas the external drive hovers between 3x and 5x. And here we see that the internal rip finishes at 26 minutes and 51 seconds, while the external rip is still chugging along with maybe, I don't know, a quarter or a fifth left to go. I'm a little curious why the internal drive would be this much faster. It doesn't seem likely that it's a SATA versus USB 3.0 issue since USB 3.0 easily has enough bandwidth to handle the peak 32 megabit per second we see with 7x rips. Maybe it's a power issue with USB just not giving the external drive enough of it? Or maybe my drive just degraded over time? Or maybe it's because the external drive is notably older and thus a slower model? Curious in any event. The external drive finally finished at 35 minutes and 41 seconds. That's almost 10 minutes slower, so it's not even close in the end. Well, that's where my super simple Hackintosh is after a system update and a couple of hardware upgrades. I got some flack for exclusively using Multibeast and Unibeast, but so far I haven't found any downsides. Everything now works as seamlessly as a hardware Mac would. My next Hackintosh video update will be either after macOS 10.14 comes out, or a year, whichever comes first. And as always, thanks for watching.